Uh, all right, I think we can slowly but surely kick off. Um, first of all, can you hear me? All right. Yes. <clears throat> okay, then. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ebovic Yubushek. I am research director at Vocal Europe. Uh, very briefly, for those who don't know what Vocal Europe is, we are a Brussels-based think tank working on EU foreign policy and some other relevant issues that have an impact and say on, on EU foreign policy. Um, in fact, this is the fourth workshop we are organizing over the past one year within the framework of thesis, anti-thesis, and thesis migration lab, which is funded by Europe for Citizen Program of the European Union. Uh, this project has uh, five partners, uh, namely from Romania, Italy, Portugal, Serbia, and Belgium. Today, one of the representatives of, of ACTA Center, our project partner from Romania, is with us, and, and she will have uh, a brief intervention about this, this issue that we are going to discuss today. Uh, the overall, yes, hello, Anke. Uh, the overall aim of this project is to discuss migration issue from different perspectives uh, and angles with young people and fight against stereotypes in our societies. And, and I think today we have a very interesting panel with, with excellent speakers, I would say. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to hand over the floor to Clara, uh, who is uh, our moderator, and, and we'll just kick off with the, with the moderation. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Clara O'Hayen, a research trainee at Vocal Europe, and I'm very excited to be here uh, at this civil society project. Uh, I'll go ahead and introduce the speakers. Uh, our first speaker today will be Dr. Kuhn Lurs. Uh, Kuhn Lurs is an assistant professor in gender and post-colonial studies at Utrecht University. His research interests include youth, migration, the city, and digital culture. Dr. Lurs is currently the chair of the European Communication Research and Education Association's Diaspora Migration and the Media section. Uh, which studies the role of the media with respect to diasporic and migrant populations. Uh, this academic year, Dr. Lurs is a fellow at the Netherlands Institute of Advanced Studies working on a monograph titled Digital Migration. Our second speaker will be Dr. Jérôme Gounod. Uh, Dr. Gounod is a research associate at the European University Institute's Migration Policy Center where he works on identifying the most influential factors driving public attitudes to immigration. Uh, prior to joining the Migration Policy Center, Dr. Guno obtained a PhD in economics from the Toulouse School of Economics, where he wrote a dissertation on the integration and assimilation of immigrants and the rise of socially conservative actors on the political scene. His current research explores attitudes to immigration, as well as the challenges raised by migrants' integration into their host society. Uh, finally, we will have a brief intervention by Anke Mill, uh, a representative for the ACTA Center in Romania, uh, which is one of Vocal Europe's project partners. Uh, I will now give the floor to Dr. Lurs for his presentation. Thanks. Uh, thanks, every speaker, Ishik and Clara O'Hayen, for the kind invitation and Vocal Europe. And let me just share my screen. Are you seeing my screen and can you hear me all right? I take that as a yes. Um, so thanks a lot for the also for the introduction uh, and, and contextualization of my work. Uh, in the last decade, I've interviewed hundreds of migrants uh, in the context of Europe and also uh, outside of Europe, including refugees, expatriates, international students. And I've taken in my work uh, digital practices, so smartphone use uh, and social media use as an entry point to understand everyday experiences of belonging, of family making, uh, of right claims and of identity construction. And from my fieldwork experiences, I would like to share today, today three main takeaways. Uh, first, I want to urge us to shift our frame uh, and to understand migrants as, in many cases, early adopters of technologies and uh, seeing them as ahead of the curve, uh, as a group that we can actually take uh, cues from uh, to learn, uh, for example, how to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic in uh, having to negotiate and be in contact with our friends and loved ones through screens, which migrants have pioneered for years. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to uh, tap into the idea of 
taking smartphones as personal digital archives uh, to render a different image, to render a different frame of migration uh, and to understand uh, what I describe as the digital passage uh, that young migrants uh, uh, undergo. And thirdly, I want to draw from ongoing work with uh, international uh, transition classes schools, with language schools in the Netherlands on uh, a media literacy uh, program, which we've developed with teachers and students, and where we've worked uh, on uh, the notion and ideas of self-representation. So how do young migrants themselves uh, represent uh, themselves against, for example, dominant stereotypes that they also themselves encounter on a daily basis in their uh, media landscape? First, let me just briefly reflect on where my passion for this topic uh, came from, because this passion can be uh, traced back to my youth. So I grew up in a small town in the southeast of the Netherlands, uh, and uh, I actually went uh, often to the local refugee camp because there were many excellent basketball players living in this camp. So I spent a lot of my time there. Uh, and so and we're here talking about the mid 90s. And I realized after studying media and communication uh, a decade later that many of my friends living in the camp were actually early adopters of technologies. So they were using uh, uh, mobile phones to keep in touch with loved ones, but also to uh, uh, connect with local bureaucracies. They had signed up to email, while me and most of my white classmates uh, in, in my school didn't have mobile phones yet. Uh, we didn't uh, have email addresses yet uh, in, the, in the mid 90s. So this uh, realization of seeing uh, migrants, in this case as early adopters, is something that we see more widely in the uh, scholarly literature. And it also uh, kind of uh, urged me to rethink and to commit uh, also to kind of a scholarly intervention into mainstream discourse. Indeed, what can we learn when we see uh, young migrants in this uh, instance as active media makers? How do they negotiate themselves in our current media landscape? And this remains very uh, persistent and urgent. If we think about how migrants uh, and particularly refugees in the wake of the 2015 so-called European refugee crisis uh, were uh, dominantly depicted, we saw across Europe this fascination uh, with refugees arriving upon European shores carrying smartphones. And this is just one indicative headline. So this was a headline of the Dutch daily Algemeen Dagblad. Uh, and their headline read, why are refugees taking selfies all the time? So the, just by asking this question, uh, why are refugees taking selfies or why are refugees carrying smartphones? I, uh, this question is very illustrative for the dominant, uh, I would say, European uh, understanding and expectation of what a refugee would look like, uh, not as someone carrying a smartphone, but maybe as someone being uh, someone being very dependent, uh, poor, disheveled, uh, 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 but not somebody carrying uh, a device which all Europeans are carrying in their pockets. And I think it's urgent to shift this frame uh, because a smartphone has become uh, a new universal good uh, and uh, for example in many instances where people uh, uh, fled from during the so-called refugee crisis they were living everyday regular lives before uh, for example the civil war uh, broke out in syria so this uh, the idea of how journalists dominantly frame uh, uh, migration dominantly frame uh, refugees is uh, it is, I think, a very uh, urgent uh, um, domain that we should scrutinize. And it's interesting to scrutinize this from the perspective of uh, young migrants. And one way to do so uh, 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 in an approach that we have been developing at Utrecht University, but also together with Mirja Georgiou from uh, the London School of Economics Media and Co Communication Department, is to look at exactly how young people have documented their everyday lives on their smartphones. So what, uh, how can we broaden uh, our understanding of the migrant experiences by taking these very archives uh, as an entry point, as a record of migrant voices, as a voice and a record and an archive, which is self-curated. So not uh, by gatekeepers such as journalists, uh, uh, not by uh, mainstream uh, or majority audiences, but by communities themselves. How can we then understand these uh, uh, smartphones and personal digital archives uh, as 
how uh, young migrants or migrants in general can witness and can become subjects of their own life stories. So this is very much a storytelling approach. And to just uh, illustrate here, we see an example uh, of a photo uh, uh, taken during field work with Amani, uh, a 19 year old uh, Syrian Dutch young woman who's holding her smartphone and she's sharing one uh, key image dear to her, which she stored on her, uh, on her smartphone. Uh, and this is a, a photo of a painting that she made, which she described uh, or titled as uh, schizophrenia. And schizophrenia was for her very much uh, a, a way to capture her uh, ambiguous experience of uh, uh, negotiating a new life in the Netherlands vis-a-vis uh, -vis dominant expectations, for example, gendered expectations, religious expectations uh, of her family members living in a diaspora and living in Syria versus expectations of her new peers in the context of the Netherlands, expectations of a global youth culture. So how was she finding her voice in the midst of all these different ties, all these different norms and expectations? For her, she felt that this was also kind of a new moment in her life. Uh, and she described this as, I now really have a chance to show myself, to explore who I am and what I'm going to do. And her archive, her personal archive showed these different steps. And this, uh, the painting Schizophrenia for her, was indicative exactly of this journey, of this journey of uh, uh, finding herself. And this, uh, what the, the, this journeying of finding oneself was actually very much recurrent. in a lot of the conversations uh, and encounters that I've had with young migrants uh, during field work. And I tried to dub this experience uh, under the heading of digital passages. And digital passages work in two ways. Uh, for many young migrants uh, that I've interviewed and that we've uh, interviewed with our team, is that uh, there, these passages are twofold. On the one hand, uh, migration journeys are increasingly taking uh, place through media landscapes. So these are increasingly di digitally mediated. For example, navigating sometimes dangerous journeys uh, is facilitated uh, through digital networks by by keeping in touch with loved ones, by keeping in touch uh, uh, with people who might have important knowledge on uh, uh, steps to take or obstacles to uh, encounter. So this is a bottom-up uh, kind of dynamic uh, where journeys are digitized, but it's also a top-down journey. So this digitization of migrant journeys is also increasingly surveilled and monitored and controlled uh, by uh, national and uh, European uh, uh, government agencies. On a second level, uh, we see how uh, uh, young people are also coming of age in a digital environment. Uh, like uh, young people globally, this also holds true for young migrants. However, their right, right of passage, which is now a digital right of passage, is also increasingly complex, like we saw with the example of Amani, how she negotiated gender expectations, expectations in, in the diaspora, uh, youth culture, uh, all these different ties and the, their, uh, her personal archive give us kind of an insight of how she was uh, uh, negotiating um, these different ties. So digital passages and how they operate uh, across different uh, levels of life. And I'll now try to give some uh, further examples exactly of how uh, we can come to understand these processes to nuance or to get a better understanding of uh, the complexity of migrant voices uh, and how we can challenge perhaps through uh, this uh, approach, the underrepresentation of migrant voices in mainstream landscapes, mainstream media landscapes. Because these me mainstream media landscapes, uh, uh, when we look in the media uh, and migration literature, there's this common understanding that uh, mainstream audiences, uh, so news audiences, media audiences, uh, get a dominant view of what migrants look like, of what refugees look like. And this is very much, uh, very often uh, an objectified uh, and, very, and a very narrow and stereotypical understanding uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, very complex individuals, very complex groups. Uh, uh, frames are very much ahistorical. There's very little attention for nuance, for diversity, for complexity. It's a very thin uh, and very stereotypical rendering very often. So a dominant view of what refugees look like. And what's now striking 
is that uh, for many young migrants, this is uh, also something that they negotiate on a daily basis. They uh, are very much aware and often very critical of how they are being depicted uh, by journalists, of how they are being depicted uh, in mainstream uh, news outlets or on social media. Uh, so for example, here uh, we see Maya, uh, who uh, made a YouTube video for her school, which is the Ithaca uh, Transition, uh, International Transition Classes School, uh, uh, close to Utrecht, uh, where she made a video. And in discussing this video about her school, uh, she said, we refugees need to get a better rep reputation, and I have to set the good example. So what does this mean uh, when many of the young people that I spoke with have this internalized idea that they have to perform in a right way, that they have to show uh, gratefulness for being accepted into Dutch society, that they have to perform this ideal citizenship almost of this ideal uh, 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 kind of portrait. So to meet the dominant expectations, to fit in, to assimilate uh, basically uh, to the Dutch uh, dominant expectations. We can look at their social media practices, their digital practices to understand how they do so. Uh, so very often strategically, uh, but also very often very critically and uh, showing great awareness exactly of the workings of our uh, media landscape and of digital circuits. Uh, over the last four years, we've uh, collaborated with international transition classes schools, which are uh, two year language programs where young newcomers to the Netherlands uh, are trained in the, in the Dutch language uh, and in kind of the dominant uh, uh, cultural, uh, cultural landscape in preparation of enrolling in regular secondary education. And in our program uh, uh, titled Critical Media Literacy to Making Media, we tried uh, to find a way uh, uh, to balance expectations of teachers and questions of teachers and students. Uh, so from the language teachers, uh, we heard very often that they didn't really know how to cope with young people being uh, connected, being constantly uh, on their phones, speaking to loved ones, speaking also to local bureaucracies. Uh, and to students, a uh, very critical uh, uh, relationship to the, uh, the social media and digital and mainstream media environments. So we tried to bring uh, different perspectives together and we built a curriculum uh, on the basis of uh, seeing smartphones uh, as a way to produce new media narratives, to, to produce new voices. And what kind of voices uh, then come out uh, over the course of these, uh, uh, the curricula and the trainings I just want to show very briefly in a uh, video report that we made, which I sh will show you now, which is a kind of three minute impression uh, of the practice and the process. D and D, and D is the proof van van die mensen. In het voorjaar van 2017 werd een lespakket mediawijsheid aangeboden aan 100 leerlingen van Itaka. Itaka Internationale Schakelklasse biedt onderwijs aan leerlingen in de leeftijd van 12 tot 18 jaar die zich voorbereiden op een toekomst in Nederland. En de mafia boss is hier daar. Hij moet wegrennen. Maar dan politie hem De voornaamste taak van deze school is het doorschakelen van anderstalige jongeren naar het Nederlandstalige onderwijs. Ook stelt de school zich een pedagogische opdracht, namelijk om deze leerlingen in Nederland een veilige vluchtheuvel te bieden. Zodat ze ruimte voelen om zichzelf als mens weer te kunnen herkennen. Well, we just got closer when we not together. We took the last bus that was a ride together. Het lespakket mediawijsheid is ontwikkeld door een team media docenten van de Universiteit Utrecht voor leerlingen tussen de 16 en 20 jaar van verschillende leerniveaus. Aan het eind van dit schooljaar zullen zij doorstromen naar vervolgonderwijs. In de lesserie van 10 dagdelen lag de focus op het zelf maken van media om actief en kritisch te leren omgaan met beschikbare media 
werden die jongeren getraind als makers in plaats van ze te begrenzen als consumenten. Daarnaast werd er aandacht besteed aan het eigen verhaal en de toekomstdromen van de leerlingen, waardoor het maakproces en hun eigen reflectie daarop ook als social empowerment diende. Hallo iedereen, Rosa Abuel in de klas. Dit is mijn beste vriendin Maha en we gaan het in onze groep. Dus uh, we gaan uh, een filmpje maken, adventures, we maken vlog, 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 vlog uh, whatever. De jongeren oefenden in de dramatische opbouw van een beeldverhaal en dachten na over identificatie en overtuiging van de kijker. Deze opdrachten hadden als doel dat de jongeren leren filteren wat mediamakers willen dat men gelooft, koopt of ondersteunt. And I'd like to, to just briefly talk to three uh, uh, themes that we uh, saw recurrent uh, in, the, in the years uh, of uh, co-teaching with uh, language teachers, uh, this media literacy curriculum, and constantly also adjusting it uh, uh, to the questions, needs, and expectations of students. The first is exactly uh, this uh, rendering of a much more complex uh, multi-layered uh, and paradoxical uh, uh, understanding of the migrant experience, where very, uh, very often uh, the products that uh, the students made were uh, very much revolving around dreams, around uh, different interpretations uh, of their contribution and their position in the society, so very much countering uh, the stereotypes that I discussed before. But also, interestingly, uh, uh, very often it also challenged our assumptions as researchers uh, and as teachers. For example, one uh, I have one vivid memory uh, of where uh, one of the assignments revolved around propaganda uh, and where uh, many of the uh, uh, students uh, actually shared awareness of that they were very much aware of how propaganda worked. So in uh, one of the videos made, uh, they made a propaganda video about their school. However, uh, instead of a positive, they wanted to frame their school in a negative light. Uh, and this was very much in line with our, uh, 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 let's say, assignment. And they could choose a topic uh, and, an, and a frame and an approach that they themselves uh, 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 preferred. So they were uh, trying to paint a negative picture of their school. So they were overturning uh, a trash uh, bins in the hallway. And they were running around, yelling, screaming, and recording this uh, uh, just to indicate uh, the, the, the kind of character and atmosphere and climate at their school. In this very hallway, however, it was also the office of the principal of the school, who was not aware of the assignment, who was not aware uh, uh, of what was being recorded, but she intervened, uh, asking the student, what are you doing here? Uh, uh, this is not, uh, you shouldn't be doing this, uh, clean up all this mess. Uh, but this intervention was then recorded into their propaganda and inserted into their propaganda video, uh, edited down, and the next day this video went viral in the school setting. Uh, after which we were called into the office of the principal uh, 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 exactly uh, to question uh, our role in this entire process, which for us was also an opportunity to, with the teachers, principal, and the students to discuss uh, the very politics of representation. So what does it mean when you have a chance to decide yourself on a frame and how does it feel for others to be framed in a negative light? So here, how the majority or people in power, like the principal, like the school management, was painted in a different light and uh, young migrants had the authority to uh, change this frame, which was for us a very much an interesting, uh, I would say also difficult, but an interesting uh, experience. And finally, and I uh, want to move towards a final example, is exactly indeed what we can learn uh, from looking at personal digital archives. So several uh, of the assignments revolved around uh, young people, inviting young people to produce narratives on the basis of important photos that they carried on their phones. So here we see a lineup, like we also saw in the short video, exactly of material uh, uh, that people were carrying uh, with them on their bodies, in their, in their pockets and what kind of narratives then uh, uh, emerged that could very much more uh, render a more complex, nuanced and, and situated understanding uh, of migrant experiences. And to just give a final example uh, of how we can change the frame, uh, how we can uh, think differently about migrant voices, I want to end with a brief uh, excerpt of an interview with Mohammed, who is a 17-year-old 
who's into horse riding and rap, and he very much uh, uh, takes us uh, with him uh, on his experiences and how he's documenting his life, his digital passages uh, on his uh, smartphone. And this is a two minute video, and after that, uh, I'm uh, concluding. I had yesterday a few films from someone. I was able to see the whole thing. The buildings are also on my street, the whole thing. The whole thing is also on my street. No buildings anymore. I thought it was a small thing. How the city looks. Ja, en sommige mensen denken, oh, als ik klein ben, dan heb ik geen problemen, heb ik geen stress. Maar dat is helemaal niet waar. Hier, hier is echt druk. In mijn, in mijn hoofd. Dat is het leven. Dat moet gewoon doorgaan. Nu begin ik met rappen, ik hoop dat het gaat lukken. Gaat iemand mensen mij helpen? Ja. Maar komt goed, komt goed. Ik hoop het. So with that, I would like to close off and thanks for and thank you for your attention. Just wanted to briefly recap the three main themes. So shifting the frame by recognizing migrants as in many instances, early adopters of uh, digital technologies intervening in the media landscape, uh, the idea of the uh, smartphone as a personal digital archive and the understanding that self-representation uh, matters. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now we'll open the floor for any question that anyone might have. Um, so please feel free to raise your hand or something like that if you'd like to speak or just go ahead and speak. Um, I know I have a question, so I guess I can go ahead and ask mine. <laughs> Um, my question was just that, so obviously it's really interesting the way in which uh, smart, smartphones and uh, the media can allow migrants and refugees to curate their own voice and to develop their own voice, but I, was, but I guess it also opens them up to making themselves vulnerable to other people seeing what they post and to potential bullying or things like that. So I wonder if this is something that they've experienced and how they navigate that as well. Uh, th yeah, thanks for that question, Clara. And, and actually, that uh, also allows me to uh, paint a more <laughs> nuanced picture because it, exactly uh, with new opportunities also come new challenges, such as indeed uh, facing backlash uh, or racism and discrimination online, which is something uh, shared among almost everyone uh, of the migrant youth that I have interviewed. But over the course, uh, uh, and, and uh, you see either uh, like maybe two main uh, strategies. One is where people uh, 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 purposefully push back uh, and respond uh, to each and every uh, one of those uh, provocations uh, uh, and to produce uh, pictures, share pictures, videos uh, and texts, etc. Uh, to nuance or push back at those stereotypes. And others who've, uh, for example, uh, uh, set up sev several profiles each directed to a specific audience. Uh, so one uh, more engaged towards intercultural dialogue, uh, one more open uh, to discussion and others more within a safe space of uh, befriended uh, and uh, uh, like-minded circles within Netherlands, diaspora uh, and international. Uh, so there uh, are different strategies, but I would say exactly uh, uh, the social media landscape can be a very, uh, um, uh, very uh, um, polarized space, uh, which presents new opportunities, but also uh, lots of challenges for sure. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions at this time? I do have one question. 
if you don't mind. Uh, you, you said, or at least it was in the video that you showed us, that the, one of the, the goal of the project that you were uh, developing with the students was to help them become not only media consumers, but also media makers, if I'm correct. And I believe it also said that the reason why this is important is because this helps them for uh, social empowerment. Could you clarify the link uh, between becoming being a media maker, creating media content, and you know the path towards greater social empowerment? Uh, I'm sorry if it's an easy question. I'm just no expert on these issues, but uh, it wasn't very very clear to me. Th thanks, thanks for that question. Uh, yeah, the ba basic assumption behind the project is exactly uh, by having uh, uh, students. Uh, uh, equipping them with the means uh, to produce media, it's a different or a, a good, a very good way uh, to also instruct uh, and to have yeah, young people realize the workings of the media. So how uh, decision making, for example, in journalistic practice, uh, uh, how this process becomes more transparent when you yourself have to think about, okay, if I say one of the assignments is, for example, carrying out an interview, uh, with somebody in your neighborhood about how uh, a big uh, uh, how a big event in their lives has changed their lives. So young people went into uh, public spaces interviewing bus drivers, for example, about their tr transformative events in their lives. Uh, so thinking about asking questions, thinking about then what to include when you're, uh, for example, editing down an audio interview or a video interview, uh, kind of uh, uh, very much shows exactly that you're constantly deciding upon frames. So do you choose for a sensational story? Do you choose for uh, an everyday uh, uh, kind of uh, a sketch of somebody's personality? So by um, opening up kind of these choices that are uh, always there in making media, uh, this for young people also felt as a way to uh, situate themselves in the uh, landscape, in the media landscape in the Netherlands, which is totally uh, saturated with uh, uh, different uh, different media producers who have different agendas and who have different audiences. So each of those makes this, uh, similar decisions geared towards a specific audience. So this was uh, one of our uh, ways uh, to invite young people to uh, see how those decisions work out in, in practice. Hope that answers the question thanks thanks um, i also have a question um it's a bit different on a different topic but um i uh watched your presentation with great interest and i would like to ask whether the scope of the whole project included economic migrants from eastern europe as well as migrants from war countries that are in war or political refugees Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the, so the media literacy project didn't differentiate on the basis of uh, migration motives or orientations. Uh, we just uh, worked with international uh, transition classes schools, which are open to newcomers of all uh, migrant backgrounds, let's say, uh, and, and in practice, uh, the demographics of the school very much mirrored migration flows into the Netherlands. Uh, maybe the uh, the largest or the most privileged groups of expatriate families, uh, they go to private schools, but other than that, economic uh, uh, migrants, uh, uh, refugee uh, families. So the demographics is very diverse in the classroom. And this was also for us a very interesting dynamic because we uh, sort of in, 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 the, in the classes always just sought to articulate the framework and have students give examples of their, uh, uh, let's say, media repertoires, which are very often informed by the, uh, their countries uh, uh, of origin, uh, which allowed us also to, uh, to discuss the different varieties in media uh, landscapes, for example, uh, or a, a YouTube uh, uh, influencer, uh, influences which are very much nation uh, uh, they specific. Uh, so we just start to bring in uh, different experiences, also migrant ex uh, migration experiences, for example, into the very process of making media. Uh, I have a question, if I may as well, Clara. 
All right, uh, very practical question uh, indeed. Uh, referring to this project media literacy, may I ask you, Dr. Lurs, uh, have you come across with some, you know, youngsters who are encountered with extremism through this project? Because as, as Mr. Ganot said, uh, this project is, as far as I understand from, from your presentation, is not to just motivate youngsters to, to be the consumers of, of media, but also to make uh, media contents as well. So are they somehow encountered with extremism, particularly those who are coming from war-torn countries? Uh, well, uh, this was, uh, and thanks for that question. Uh, uh, th this really came up quite often in discussing techniques of propaganda. Uh, so usually classes would look like that we would start with uh, uh, bringing in a, a theory on uh, uh, to think about the media. And one of those was propaganda. So the workings of propaganda. And in, th in this case, uh, uh, many students uh, with a history in, in the Middle East gave themselves examples of uh, the workings of social, uh, the embrace of social media, for example, uh, among uh, ISIS. Um, and uh, how they would target specific uh, groups and how uh, uh, they themselves had encountered those videos and how to relate uh, to those videos. Um, so this was a very often a topic of discussion. Sometimes with teachers, we heard that this was also very much a sensitive topic. So we always just waited for students to bring it in rather than us prompting uh, students reflections. But in, uh, in almost all of the classes, so we have worked with over 250 students uh, and almost all of the classes this was a topic of, uh, of debate uh, so many of uh, uh, the young migrants in those classrooms have witnessed uh, uh, online extremism in, in videos particularly yeah thank you uh, if there aren't any more questions at this time I guess we should move forward and open the floor to Dr. Guno's presentation all right thank you let me share my screen okay okay is it working can you hear me okay, yes fine okay uh so yeah so, uh, thank you very much uh to vocal europe for for this invitation this opportunity to speak at this workshop um i'm going to talk uh from a rather different angle than uh, Dr. Lois did. Uh, I don't have fieldwork experience myself, so my insight will be quite different in this respect. I'm going to cover very broadly uh, some of the drivers and attitudes to migrants' integration within host societies. And then, uh, based on, on the discussion, I will try to um, talk about the reason why migrants are left out of the debate on uh, integration. So I would like to start with a few introductory remarks. I think it's important before I start that I define uh, in, in accurate and precise terms what I will be discussing today, especially what I, I mean and when I am speaking of integration. Uh, first, I would like to say that uh, Dr. Lowe's presentation was, I believe, mostly about uh, refugees uh, and also asylum seekers. Um, my presentation will, uh, be will be about uh, refugees and asylum seekers and also about immigrants from, I would say, low-income countries. The reason for this is that when we speak of integration, uh, I think we have to bear in mind that the needs and expectations of immigrants are, are different. And there are several kinds of immigrants. Uh, there are refugees, there are uh, asylum seekers, there are economic migrants. And within economic migrants, you have migrants from low-income countries and high-income countries. And when you look at the literature, the state of the literature today, you just realize how different their aspirations are when it comes to integration. So I think it's important that I make that point very clear from the beginning. And I will be speaking about the needs or an expectation or generally speaking about immigrants uh, that are either low income countries, uh, economic migrants or refugees or asylum seekers, because these migrants um, are asking and expecting a lot more in terms of integration than migrants from high income countries. Uh, they're actually uh, also, uh, incidentally, a lot more likely to stay uh, in their host country after their arrival. Um, so 
<clears throat> again, uh, the definition of integration is not extremely clear, um, even the, the, among academics. There is no academic consensus on the definition of uh, integration. I don't believe there is one uh, among the European policy making world either. Uh, so in this uh, presentation, I will be speaking of a specific type of integration, namely not the one that uh, deals with the cultural assimilation of immigrants. So by this, I mean that I will not be talking about the assimilation of culture and social values, uh, conventions and norms, which are sometimes measured through uh, religious affiliations, uh, language, uh, fluency, uh, inter-ethnic marriage, the, the names or, or the sort of things that you would think define cultural assimilation. Instead, I will be focusing on economic, social and political integration through the rights that immigrants have in European societies. Uh, I will not have time just to discuss uh, any solutions, but I will try to give you uh, a, few, uh, a few, some insights uh, on, on the reason why um, the economic, social and political rights that migrants are entitled to uh, today uh, are lagging somewhat. Um, so moving on and starting now with the uh, economic integration, I would like to discuss the barriers to integration on the labor market. There are several of them. I won't have time to cover all of them, but I would like to stress uh, legal, geographical and informational obstacles to, integration, to economic integration. So the first and perhaps more immediate uh, intuitive obstacles are the legal obstacles. Uh, if you think of the, the barriers for newly arrived immigrants to enter the labor market, you have to think of work visas. And again, remember that I'm talking about income uh, immigrants, sorry, from outside Europe, I said low income countries, uh, I'm generally referring to immigrants who are not European. And for those immigrants uh, outside the uh, European Union, of the European Union, a work visa is, uh, is essential if they want to, uh, to have the right to, to work legally in, uh, in Europe. There are also costly opportunities and sometimes, sometimes simply lack there of training and language classes. So sort of training that, and, and we saw that, uh, I believe in Dr. Lewis' presentation, that some of the, the benefits of the project that we're developing were, was to actually uh, allow immigrants to access secondary and tertiary education. So these procedures and these sort of training for newly arrived immigrants in terms of language and skills are uh, either costly or sometimes simply absent from the policy framework. And there is also the issue of uh, recognition of previous work experiences and diplomas. Uh, and I will, I will get back to that point later, but that's, this obviously is a very uh, important issue when it comes to overqualification of immigrants in their jobs. Then there's the geographical challenge for migrants to reach job opportunities because of where they live. And by this, I mean uh, two different things. It can be uh, the result of simply the allocation of refugees because the, the refugee centers uh, are located in remote places or are not located where the job opportunities are. Or it can be also, uh, I would say a deliberate choice uh, because economic migrants obviously will choose the destination country and the place uh, where they settle based on information about job opportunities. But this is not the only driver of the decision. They also uh, usually join existing networks. Uh, sometimes they join their families that have been, you know, they've been, they, they moved to the countries before them or communities because these communities can help them uh, deal with the, the, the life in the new, in the new country. And, and these are not always aligned with labor market considerations and incentives. And that's, that's a, a real problem in terms of matching um, some job supply and, uh, and the demand uh, from, from businesses. So geographically speaking, but also, or generally speaking, I think there's a relative absence of matching between the supply of migrant skills and qualifications and uh, the, 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 the demand from businesses and companies, which is simply what uh, the, uh, the companies could expect from these immigrants. Next, I'd like to turn to the issue of uh, welfare, uh, welfare uh, services and the, the obstacles that prevent access to social and health benefits for immigrants. Um, if you think of welfare benefits, you have to think that a lot of them are conditional on 
uh, working and having a job. Uh, but you also have requirements in terms of nationality to be eligible to these benefits. So you think that a migrant, an immigrant that just arrived in his, in his host country in Europe uh, would face both of these barriers uh, before he or she can act, have access to, to welfare benefits. There's also, and, and this is sometimes overlooked, but a cultural uh, dimension to the absence of or the relative lack of, of access to welfare. Because cultural, mat cultural matters when it comes to accessing and using social benefits, uh, it's been shown that actually, you know, having previous experience with welfare, of welfare services will increase and improve the access and, and the, the amount of information that one can have about the, the benefits, the social benefits that he or she is entitled to. If you think of health uh, benefits, uh, there, there are a couple of, let's say, different issues. Informational uh, obstacle remain, but there's also a problem in terms of uh, cultural and language uh, barriers because we are not, or let's say generally speaking, European societies are not in a position to precisely identify the needs of migrants uh, in terms of health. And uh, there's a, simply a scarcity of data on the way uh, they use healthcare and what they need in terms of healthcare. And that's actually uh, not the presentation, but Dr. Lois made, made me think that the, the digitalization and the fact that immigrants are using the media uh, might might actually help uh, with that issue, uh, precisely because the, the smartphones could be, and smartphones, or generally speaking, the media could be one way of exchanging information, both from the receiving societies in terms of communicating communicating about the rights that migrants have, and on, and also the other way around, which would be migrants telling about their needs and expectations. So here I'm speaking about health needs, but I'm I'm sure that this could be this could be extended to different sorts of, of needs. And finally, in the current context and and and, and days, uh, and you 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 would think that um, when uh, economic crisis hit uh, Western countries, the the need uh, or, or of for austerity policies will result in cutbacks on migrant targeted welfare programs. Uh, one of the reasons, not the only one, but one of the reasons for that, obviously, is because these migrants do not have voting rights, and I will get back to this in a, in a few seconds, but this is also, uh, if, you, if you look back on the past 20 or 15 years, uh, probably a reason why they, they have made relatively little progress in the field of, uh, of um, helping immigrants with, uh, with welfare services. Now, turning to political integration, uh, I would say that it is arguably an area of weakness for integration uh, policy. Um, if you look at uh, the figures across Europe, uh, so this is to give you put things in perspective, but 10 million non-EU citizens currently living, and I'm talking about non-EU uh, residents, so not in, I'm talking about legal immigrants, are completely disenfranchised from voting in the country of, res of residence. That means they do not have the right to cast a single vote in any elections whatsoever. And when uh, these non-EU citizens are entitled to vote, it is uh, almost always in local elections. If you look at the map on the right-hand side here, you'll see that blue is dominating or purple is dominating Europe. And those are countries where non-EU foreigners do not have the right to vote, not even in local elections. Now you have some uh, different patterns in Scandinavia um, where every resident or non-EU foreigners, legal resident, of course, uh, are allowed to vote. Uh, but those, I believe, for Scandinavian countries at least, those rights are limited to local elections. Um, and you see that in the UK, so UK is a bit different because I think uh, nationals from the citizens from the Commonwealth countries have the right to vote, uh, I believe in local elections, not sure about national elections. But the takeaway from this map is largely that uh, political integration is very much lacking across Europe, meaning that immigrants rarely have the right to vote. And for them, uh, as a result, citizenship and naturalization is the only way to access political representation. And, and if you think of citizenship procedures, uh, there are two main caveats. The first one is the number of years that you have to wait. So technically, in Europe, it's probably around five years, but it can be more than this. But I'd say the average is slightly uh, more than five years before, before you can apply 
to uh, citizenship for citizenship in your uh, country of residence. And the second caveat is the cost of this procedure, because it's usually very costly. Um, it's usually over 100 euros. It can go up to over a thousand pounds in the UK, if I'm right. Um, and and this this costly uh, process is barring a lot of immigrants from simply accessing political representation, political integration. And this is a, a, a very salient issue. And I'll say that I'm not aware of any studies in Europe on that on that um, particular issue. But I know that in the US, uh, there are studies showing that the a fee waiver, so the removal of these costs, had had a significant impact on uh, citizenship take up among uh, foreigners. And finally, uh, if you look into other signs or, or markers of political integration, you'll, you would also notice in Europe, for instance, migrants are uh, significantly less represented in, in political parties than native citizens, and the ratio is about one to five. So politically speaking, uh, integration is, is still you know, uh, struggling and, and behind in, in terms of uh, progress than, than probably social and economic uh, rights. Now, in the next, uh, in the next uh, part of the presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit about why the, 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 the legal and, and, and obstacles and the, the status of, of migrants in terms of integration is, uh, is unequal, is not even with that of, of natives. And one of the main reasons behind this, this, this uh, inequality and this uh, discrepancy is probably the resistance from the native populations. Uh, and by this, I mean their attitudes to integration uh, play a big part in, in, in you know, driving the, the current situation and explaining the current situation uh, when it comes to integration. Native citizens are actually, uh, you know, something sometimes overlooked when you, when you think of, of social exclusion and integration and, and when you, you think in terms of policy, but there are several uh, issues on which you know they they uh, they display anti-immigration or anti-integration attitudes, and which I believe play uh, a big part in in explaining the current situation. The first one, it's uh, linking back to the economic integration slide, is that there is the fear of labor competition. So competition on the labor market with immigrants is something that is real, that is documented. Um, I'd also say that there is hiring, hiring discrimination in the labor market. This is also documented in the, in the scientific, scientific literature. But both of these factors explain why you know, the, the immigrants are not always treated and not always even legally entitled to the same rights as um, native citizens in terms of having a job and entering the labor market. If you think of social and welfare benefits, which we have discussed before, there is, again, documented in the literature, this welfare chauvinism, which is the idea that you want to exclude supposedly undeserving immigrants from redistribution because they are stealing social benefits from natives. That's the whole narrative behind the, the welfare chauvinism issue, which is basically excluding uh, immigrants from the welfare system because you think they do not deserve to have access to it. And this is something that exists in the native population and something that's obviously hampering uh, integration. Now, if, we, if we're thinking of, uh, of more cultural uh, factors, uh, you can think of the uh, consequences of terrorist attack uh, well, uh, in the past 20 years and the backlash that ensued leading to securitization laws targeting subgroup of immigrants. So here I've put it as an example. I know it's not in Europe, it's the US Muslim ban, but it's probably the most recent and striking example of the consequences of this backlash. So it's barring immigrants from specific countries to enter, uh, in that instance, the US because of the religious affiliations of these immigrants. But generally speaking, uh, even if we haven't had any, any type of, of, of laws uh, that, that would just go as far as barring entry from specific countries, I believe that there is clearly a backlash uh, that, that led you know, people to become less open or societies simply to become less open to immigration from outside Europe in the past 10 to 15 years. Uh, and finally, uh, there's also a position from natives uh, to political rights based on the policy consequences that this could have. Uh, you might know that 
immigrants are usually considered to be a group that is significant, that is different from natives in terms of cultural and socioeconomic positions, and this is actually true. And natives often anticipate that they this will lead uh, immigrants to hold different political preferences. Uh, there are some works, not that many, uh, in my in, uh, uh, as far as I know, but some works showing that immigrants are on average, relatively more left-leaning, politically speaking, than natives, and uh, some other works showing that they do indeed vote rather differently than, uh, than natives. And the whole, uh, you know, sort of expectation uh, that, that uh, this, the, the group of immigrant people might have different preferences and therefore change the policy and political outcome of elections is something that natives do take into account. Um, there, is, there are not that many, again, uh, studies that I know of on the issue of attitudes to political rights, but uh, in Switzerland, there have been a lot of referenda uh, on, on that issue, and, and the great majority of them, I think it's 70% or 80% of them, um, turned out where you know, native Swiss people actually rejected uh, the rights of uh, foreigners to vote in local elections. Now, how does that explain or, or relate to the underrepresentation of immigrants in the debate? Well, I think that first and foremost, migrants are underrepresented in the debate because they lack political uh, power and political clout, which means they, they're not able to be represented among politicians and decision makers. And this is a very, uh, a very important aspect of, of, the, the, of uh, in underrepresentation. The second uh, reason is that you know, and that integration is probably not only about policy and, and, and what's best for immigrants and receiving society in, in economic terms and social terms, but it's also uh, a tool for political campaigning and political ambitions. I do not have to convince you that in recent years, the uh, anti-immigration rhetoric has increased and become more popular among politicians. Uh, so the integration of culturally distant immigrants is an extremely political issue. There are vested interests here which are playing out and obviously not in the favor of immigrants. Uh, as an example of this, uh, you, can, you can think that, uh, you can see that, that immigrants are lacking a political voice uh, and, and that the promises that can be made towards immigrants are therefore not binding. Uh, here I've put an example that I'm aware of, and this was this dates back to 2012, where the then candidate, presidential candidate, François Hollande, uh, made the promise to enfranchise non-EU uh, immigrants in local elections, so give them the right to vote in the local elections. He made that promise during the campaign uh, and never followed through. But this is just an example to give you a sense of how the lack of political representation means that the promises that are made towards greater integration are in effect, uh, non-binding. Now, there's another dimension uh, beside political uh, aspects of underrepresentation of immigrants, which um, deals with or bears on, on cultural and demographic issues. Um, there is clearly cultural racism uh, in Western society, and that leads to social distancing and lower acceptance of immigrants as stakeholders. Uh, what do I mean by this? I've already mentioned cultural prejudice before. What I mean by this is that when uh, you are, uh, you consider, and, and I gave you an example here with um, a study from the Pew Research Center, but when you consider that immigrants are particularly dangerous uh, with respect to you know, economic concerns or, or security or crime, then you're even less likely to accept them as decision makers. And in particular, this is also barring second and sometimes third generation immigrants to uh, be incorporated and participate in the process of designing integration policy. So, you know, roots and, and embedded cultural racism is actually preventing the inclusion of immigrants into, uh, into the, the design and implementation of policies. Uh, and not, I'm not only talking about refugees and, and first generation immigrants, I'm talking about the general cultural embedded racism uh, that also hurts second and third generation uh, immigrants. Um, there is also a demographic uh, obstacle, which is that in general, uh, immigrants are relatively younger than, uh, than Western, than the average Western citizen. And there is a competing dynamic between 
the, the aspirations of a young migrant population in an aging Western society. Um, what I mean by this is that technically you wouldn't maybe expect that what migrants want from uh, their receiving country is what the receiving country itself, so but I, by this I mean the citizens and the politicians want or expect from immigrants. I'll give you an example. Uh, well, I, I've talked a little bit about this, but there's a massive overqualification problem uh, among immigrants. There's more than a third of tertiary educated immigrants that are overqualified for their job, as opposed to only a quarter of natives. Um, and you'd seen, you would think that addressing the, the, the matching between job qualifications and, and actual job is not necessarily aligned with the, the labor uh, policies that are developed or, or designed by, uh, by go national governments, because this is not a problem, or it is a problem obviously at 25%, but it is not as much a problem as uh, it is for immigrants. And so the priorities when it comes to uh, improving or, or facilitating a job search or improving the labor market will be, uh, obviously will be those of natives and not those of immigrants. Um, if you think uh, more recently of the, uh, the, the initiative from the van der Leyen EU Commission of protecting our citizens and our value, uh, so which aimed, I believe, to preserve a distinctiveness of, of you know, the, the cultural narr narratives of, of European way of life, this is something that answer and addresses na some natives' concerns. But from the point of view of immigrants, I am not sure that this is going in the direction that they expect. So again, I'm, uh, what I'm saying here is that natives and receiving societies have some concerns and here we're talking about cultural concerns. And this is not necessarily, necessarily something that will have help immigrants integrate into their receiving societies. Um, and finally, I think this point is very important. Uh, there is this complexity uh, can be observed in actual policy. Uh, the design and uh, of actual integration policies. And I, I think the success of these policies depend on whether they meet migrant needs and expectations. Uh, of, I'm giving you here the, an example that is, that is taken from, uh, from Belgium. Um, there was a uh, reform in uh, 2000 of the naturalization process, so which opened possibility to, to many and several thousands of, of immigrants, non-EU immigrants, the possibility to acquire Belgian citizenship and there was a massive participation of immigrants, massive take up. Uh, the number of naturalizations more than doubled in the two years that followed the uh, naturalization reform. And it was, uh, in, at least from a statistical uh, and numerical point of view, uh, extremely successful. Four years later, uh, the reform was passed that uh, allowed non-EU immigrants to vote in local elections. That was in 2004. The result uh, was that only a very min small minority of these non-EU residents actually enrolled uh, as, as voters. And, and the turnout at the election, I think that the, the next municipal elections after the reform in 2006 was extremely low, around 15% among these uh, non-EU residents. Um, what, what, what this tells us is this basically, the accession to citizenship was viewed as much, much more valuable to non-EU immigrants than simply the right to vote in local elections. And I believe uh, both reforms were probably going in the right direction if we think of integration. They were allowing for greater integration of immigrants. One was very successful, the other relatively not. And the difference between the two is probably that the incentives uh, of the first reform, the naturalization reform, was a lot more aligned uh, with, with what migrants expected, because with citizenship not, comes not only political rights, but greater political uh, economic integration and social integration. So to conclude, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, where I've tried to, to uh, discuss various uh, obstacles to migrants integration, I think it's important to remember that they can take different forms. They can be legal, geographical, demographic, cultural or political, political. Uh, but what's important is that when you think of integration at the political level, it cannot be completely separated from cultural assimilation. And it has a high political sensitivity. Uh, so the, the very fact that cultural assimilation 
cannot be separated from actual economic, social, and political integration create a, a very complex challenge because the cultural assimilation usually takes longer to uh, to take takes longer to happen, while integration has a different timescale pace and probably different drivers as well. And I think that increasing immigrants' uh, representation in the debate could probably help to reconcile uh, the interest on both sides, immigrants and society, which I've said uh, that you know they can be competing with each other. Uh, and in particular, I think that this could help to host society perceive, you know, reconcile what host society perceive as successful integration with the incentives that migrants have to integrate. I've put here a couple of references if you want to look further into the issue of integration, some that I know of, just this is not an, an exhaustive list. Uh, there's some academia and, and policy research from different uh, centers, academic and non-academic centers. And in terms of field programs, I know that the EU fund some projects and regional projects to uh, facilitate the integration of immigrants and that the OECD Regional Development Policy Committee is also involved in some, uh, in some projects. That'll be all, and uh, thank you for your attention. Great, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Guno. Um, we're now gonna open the floor for some questions. If anyone has any at this time, feel free to speak up. Yeah, good morning, my, my name is David. I thank you very much, first of all, for the presentation. It was really interesting. And I was wondering, uh, regarding the future of migrant integration in Europe, May I ask you if in the next years, because of the pandemic, the integration of migrants will be better in terms of access to healthcare and political representation, or if on the contrary, migrant, in migrant integration will worsen uh, because states will reason in nationalistic terms? I, thank you very much. Uh. Yeah, thank you for this question. I think it's, uh, it's a, a very good question to ask yourself and, and actually everybody what will happen if, uh, in, the next, uh, in the next couple of years. My answer, this is only my take on, on the situation and trying to predict what will happen in the near future based on what we know and what is going on, have been going on for a couple of years, is that the national uh, narrative and, and the sort of nationalistic mindset will prevail. Um, and if you think of access to, uh, access to vaccines, for instance, or access to healthcare, specific healthcare, needs related to the COVID situation. My uh, guess would be that uh, we are more likely to uh, go towards a nationalistic approach and, and management of, of the situation than uh, greater solidarity or greater integration of immigrants. Um, this is only based on, on what I can see from you know, what's going on today and what I've been, has been going on in the past years, um, I do not have any sort of scientific argument, if you will, to give you in favor of this, uh, uh, of this uh, you know, uh, opinion. But yeah, I think sadly that, uh, that yeah, this is more, uh, more likely to take the uh, nationalistic path than the uh, international uh, path. Thank you. I can see that Katerina uh, raised her hand. Uh, feel free to speak if you have a question. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks to both of you for this very interesting presentation. Uh, it's not actually a question, it's more maybe if you want to like a request for information. Um, just because especially during your presentation, Jerome, you, you did speak about sort of the natives' attitudes and the, that god-awful von der Leyen commission uh, motto mm -hmm. on protecting the European uh, uh, lifestyle and all of that. And I was just wondering, because I think in this conversation, we always put the onus of integrating on the migrants and the refugees. And I think we're sort of missing out that the native population should also be, you know, involved in all of those efforts, because, you know, if you're not welcome, if there's sort of a wall, it, there's not really much uh, for you to integrate. So I was just wondering if you have any sort of data or even initiatives that you've seen, maybe not just in Europe, but in, you know, in other continents as well, of sort of more integrated approaches to, uh, um, to integration in a way mm -hmm. that just, that doesn't, again, just put the, the, the burden of proof on mm -hmm. the migrants or those coming in. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I don't know if 
I, I can answer first, and then Dr. Lewis would uh, will give you his uh, his opinion on this. But uh, personally, I'm not aware of uh, initiatives uh, from the native civil society, uh, which would sort of you know meet migrants halfway, so to speak, in terms of integration, and you know be the active player in this in this process, of sort of you know taking a step towards migrants in whatever initiatives or, or forums that would help them in, integrate and, and uh, assimilate into their host society. Um, I personally work rather on, on attitudes to immigration uh, and sometimes policy as well, but policy is something that is most of the time designed uh, by governments or, or public authorities. authorities. Um, and I, I'm not personally aware of any, any sort of um, initiatives or movements that would, uh, that would you know, deal with or what you're you're referring to, uh, and so when we we talk about attitudes and, and think about attitudes to immigration, uh, most of the time uh, it is uh, sadly I would say, but uh, anti-immigration or negative attitudes to immigration and not positive attitudes to immigration. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm afraid I can't give you any more information on, on this on this issue. I wish uh, maybe there is actually, uh, but but. As far as I'm uh, aware, uh, there is no uh, no such uh, thing. That's what I thought. <laughs> I, I can just maybe briefly uh, respond from uh, readings that I've encountered more from critical theory, postcolonial theory, exactly problematizing this very notion of integration, <clears throat> which in, in practice indeed has become a sort of a institutionalized as a one-way street. Uh, not a kind of two-way interaction. Um, so within, uh, exactly within the fields of critical theory and post-colonial theory, uh, 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 I think you might find some leads, but particularly I was also thinking about an artistic intervention here, uh, which is a documentary uh, called The Color White uh, by the documentary maker called Sunny Bergman, uh, who has done work in Netherlands and UK uh, and in this uh, documentary, she interestingly interviews, uh, starts of the documentary interviewing uh, people in the street, white majority Dutch people, uh, to what extent they are integrated in the Dutch society, uh, exactly shifting this frame. So what is it, how, and it's very interesting to see how people respond to this question. Uh, and uh, I think this might be an interesting, perhaps an interesting, uh, a documentary for you. I'll copy the link in the chat. Thanks, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so just being conscious of time, I'm going to let Anne Camille uh, give us a brief intervention and then we'll wrap things up. Thank you for the questions and comments. I don't think we can hear you. Sorry. Sorry, yes, I always forget. Uh, thank you for the organization for putting together such an uh, insightful uh, workshop today. Thank you to our speakers. Uh, it has been uh, very enlightening to see your presentations. Um, I will, first of all, I thought about discussing about the problem of Romanian migration in uh, European countries. But then um, my second uh, choice was to talk about misrepresentation of refugees, not migrants, in Romania. Um, I shall give you a short outline of Romania's situation in migration and refugee problems, I mean, on Romanian territory. So Romania is not a target country for refugees in general. It is a transit country and um, requests for asylum are quite, um, are, are quite small. However, this year, uh, due to um, conjunction of international events, the request for asylum um, um, permits has tripled in December 2020. Um, as you geographically, uh, as you know, geographically, Romania stands at the border with Serbia, 
and with Hungary. And as Hungary has a total and a complete no uh, refugee policy, uh, Serbia has to deal with uh, the refugees at the borders. Uh, however, several refugees come to Romania in the hope of making their way onwards to Western Europe through countries such as Germany, Belgium, Holland, and so on. Um, the fact that so many refugees came to Romania starting with December 2020 has created a refugee crisis in our country, which the authorities could not address properly. Um, the largest city at the western uh, border in Romania is Timisoara, and this is the city that actually deals with most refugees. The refugees camp are in, in that area. And um, the Romanian authorities have found themselves uh, completely hopeless at dealing with uh, the need for accommodation and the need for food for these people. So um, I was in contact through Task Migration Labs, the labs that we organized. So our previous uh, lab was exactly on the topic of this crisis, how the local society managed to overcome all the stereotypes and all the preconceived ideas they had about, um, yeah, about refugees from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Middle Eastern countries in general, and how they worked together, and they still do, um, and produce one hot meal a day. So there is this, this, uh, this NGO in Timisoara Logs, uh, which has managed to, to um, make all the churches, then, and this is unprecedented, regardless of religion, they all take a rota and they take care of the lunch per day. Um, many volunteers, young volunteers, have joined in this, um, in this work. And it is amazing what these people are doing with feeding the refugees. And now as the temperatures dropped, suddenly dropped to minus, uh, to, to sub-zero uh, degrees in, um, in Timisoara, they also found accommodation for them in the local hostels. So um, while refugees are <clears throat> misrepresented in Romania from legal point of view, uh, the local society, uh, people, just ordinary people, uh, join forces and they give a hand at uh, dealing with this problem. Romania is quite novel to the topic of receiving immigrants. We are mostly used to sending migrants to um, different countries of Europe, but this is a very wide topic to discuss. Um, However, uh, things are changing and through the uh, flux of refugees and immigrants, local communities managed to find unity and they managed to uh, find a way to appreciate their skills and their, um, and their relations in general in order to help uh, refugees. However, as um, our discussion in the previous workshop was, uh, there is still need for uh, advocacy, legal advocacy about the rights and about the procedures and the steps that need to be taken in order to ensure that refugees do have the security of at least a week, a month, of their stay and not depend on the um, goodwill of the people, although that is also amazing. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, does anyone have any questions at this time or comments on this or anything more generally? If not, then uh, I guess we'll move ahead to closing remarks. Yeah. Um, well, I want to thank our speakers for joining us today uh, and for all the participants for fostering such a lively conversation. 
Uh, Dr. Lurs, thank you for talking about migrant youth and digital media and about how young migrants negotiate different expectations. Uh, Dr. Gunu, thank you for presenting the different types of barriers for migrant integration and for elucidating the reasons behind the underrepresentation of migrants um, in politics. Uh, and finally, thank you very much, um, uh, Anka Mill, for your presentation uh, of the refugee crisis, the recent refugee crisis in Romania. Uh, do we have any comments at this point? Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, uh, I just wanted to thank you for, for obviously putting together the workshop. Um, maybe I didn't have time to say that during my presentation. Um, I put my email at the end of the presentation, so I, I just noticed that Dr. Lewis uh, sent a message on the chat. Uh, of course, if everybody, anybody wants to continue this conversation, I have more information uh, as far as I'll be able to, to give it to him or her. Um, feel free to write me an email. Uh, well, uh, so yeah, I just want to make that clear that uh, if, if I'm open to continuing the discussion. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Izik, I can't hear you at this time. I don't know if other people can hear you. No. <laughs> A communication issue. Oh. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess all is good. <laughs> and uh, this is the end of this workshop. Thank you all for participating. Oh, and do please complete the uh, the the form that Mr. Izik shared, uh, and I'll send you an email to remind you to receive your certificate of attendance. Thank you very much. Have a good day.